I am going to talk today about the way in which some Irish historians write about alleged sectarian behaviour by the IRA, leading up to the formation in 1922 of the Irish Free State and to the formation of Northern Ireland. My remarks are based on an essay available online. It contains all of the source material for what I'm about to say and also additional information. Eyewitnesses to the 1919-23 to Irish War of Independence and Civil War have given way to the professional historian who, it is said, searches written sources to arrive at dispassionate and more holistic accounts of what really happened. Not merely that, Fergal McGarry wrote recently that new revisionist accounts present a more complex picture of the revolution at its grassroots. They incorporate, he said, wider strands of sectarian, agrarian and intracommunal conflict. Sectarian and intracommunal conflict was of particular interest to McGarry in his biography of War of Independence leader Owen O'Duffy, who is better known as leader in the 1930s of the Blue Shirt Movement. O'Duffy as such does not overly concern us. I will be concentrating on analysis of the IRA killing in Monaghan in April 1921 of a woman called Kate Carroll. Out of 196 or thereabouts, she was one of three women the IRA executed as spies or informers during the conflict. I will be questioning a number of assertions with regard to Kate Carroll's death summarized here on screen. They range from suggestions that Carroll was killed for sectarian reasons, for alcohol related reasons, or for not so romantic reasons. All in all, she was portrayed as a marginalized and vulnerable individual whose lack of status contributed to her demise. These historians' views are a product of the wider strands of conflict identified by Fergal McGarry. They emerged during the 1990s when historians asserted that the IRA targeted and oppressed groups of Irish people. The late Professor David Fitzpatrick of Trinity College Dublin, originally from Australia, though with Irish connections, first said this in 1990. Fitzpatrick repeated the point in 2012. Also in a TCD history workshop book he edited called Terror in Ireland. He referred to a Republican terrorism which sought vengeance against what he termed detested groups, such as declared loyalists, Freemasons, orange men, ex-servicemen, military deserters, ex-policemen, those associated in any way with Crown forces or administration, and most contentiously, Protestants. Kate Carroll's death was recorded in that way from 1986 to the present day. It was part of a research field pioneered by Fitzpatrick's doctoral student, the late Peter Hart, a Newfoundland historian also with Irish connections. He first wrote in 1993 of the IRA targeting Protestants. In 1996, he accused the IRA in South Leinster and Munster of pursuing Protestants in campaigns of what might be termed ethnic cleansing. Two years later, Fitzpatrick added homosexuals and divorced people including, as in 2012, most contentiously Protestants. That year, Hearts, the IRA and its enemies alleged IRA targeting of Cork Protestants. Appended to his long list of IRA enemies were, amongst others, prostitutes, Jews, unmarried mothers and mixed marriage couples. Promoting sectarian and other issues to the forefront of a hitherto unrevealed so-called hidden history, was considered not just academically rigorous, but also was regarded as a much needed exercise in healthy self-questioning. It resembled a left-wing critique of a narrow-minded reactionary even IRA. Kevin Myers asserted in commentary on Hart's contribution that IRA morality police initiated what the newly independent Irish state later institutionalized. Had ISIS then been in existence, the IRA would probably have been compared with it. Influential commentators like Myers linked his opposition to the IRA in the past to more recent IRA activity in Northern Ireland, especially as its armed campaign wound down and peace process activity replaced it. These revisionist historians' claims suffered some evidential shortcomings. In 2015, Paul Taylor's Heroes or Traitors demonstrated that ex-soldiers from World War I were not IRA targets. Likewise, despite having achieved soundbite status, claims that the IRA attacked unmarried mothers, mixed marriage couples, adulterers, divorced people, prostitutes, Jews and homosexuals were soon, albeit silently, abandoned. Peter Hart also retreated. In 2003, he reversed himself and observed that Southern Protestant communities were not in fact victims of ethnic cleansing. In 2006, 
he mistakenly asserted that he had never said otherwise, but he still maintained that Protestants were victims of persecution. But why was bringing Protestants into the mix so, as David Fitzpatrick put it, contentious? Partly because, though revisionist accounts often ignore the point, Southern Protestant communities publicly refuted claims that they were mistreated. They also criticised Ulster Unionists for attacks on Northern Roman Catholics. Here is one example from members of Protestant churches in Skull, West Cork, in late April 1922. Southern Ireland's small Protestant population, which opposed partition, sensed that Northern co-religionists cared sufficiently about their alleged plight to make propaganda from it, but little more. Nationalist inclusivity made continual inroads into Protestant communities that also retained a significant Republican tradition, as detailed in some recent publications. This would have been impossible if the IRA systematically targeted Protestants, including Unionists. Despite Southern Protestant churches and most Protestants retaining a British allegiance, their settled view was delivered in 1924 by TCD Provost Henry Barnard, a convinced Unionist and former Church of Ireland Archbishop of Dublin. He said it was as Loyalist and not as Protestant that members of the Church of Ireland had suffered. The Protestant and formerly overtly Unionist Irish Times agreed in 1935 affirming in effect that sectarianism had been a systemic feature of Northern Unionist, not Southern Republican politics. In the mid to late 1920s, what were referred to as die-hard loyalists, plus their allies in the imperial right in Britain, persuaded the British government to fund confidential compensation claims. This segment of Southern loyalists asserted they were victims during the conflict, on the basis of active support for the Crown. Some claims included allegations of sectarianism. One successful claimant, former Crown Solicitor for Cork, Jasper Wolfe, publicly rejected them. His financial losses and attacks on his person were a result of activity in support of Crown forces, nothing to do with his Methodist identity. He insisted both privately and publicly. Presenting Southern Protestants as occupying a marginal community was problematic for another reason. They were, relative to the rest of the population, rich. Protestants ran things. Up to the early 1970s, that is 50 years after independence, the then 4% Protestant population supplied 25% and more of bank directors and directors of manufacturing firms, many of which only are largely promoted Protestants into management and supervisory grades. In 1922, the Church of Ireland Gazette observed accurately that the Protestant community holds a commanding position in the South's economic life. The religious minority's socioeconomic status was a colonial residue that survived the erosion, but not elimination, of discrimination against Roman Catholics during the 19th century. The prospect and, and then realisation in 1922 of substantive independence from Crown control gave rise to discomforting thoughts of more equitable wealth distribution. Though the conflict was accompanied by um, industrial unrest, advances in trade union organisation and land seizures, fears of expropriation proved groundless. After defeating anti-treaty opponents in the 1922-23 civil war, the Irish Free State was far from socialist. Neither was it intent on doing to Southern Protestants what the Roman Catholics suffered in Northern Ireland. During the 1990s, historiography, that is the writing of history, on these questions was heavily influenced by establishment concerns about Northern Ireland's post-1968 troubles. A native versus settler conflict narrative there was transposed onto and helped to considerably confuse the Southern past. Sectarian attitudes displayed openly by Northern Unionists were allegedly imprinted in reverse on 1920s opponents of British rule. Historians portrayed secular Republican rhetoric as merely gestural, undermined by a visceral local sectarianism. Before 1922, it was alleged by some historians, in agreement with diehard loyalist and Ulster Unionist propaganda, that victimised and innocent Protestants got it in the neck. To demonstrate how such historical narratives are constructed and reinforced, I will look at an overlooked example concerning the death of Kate Carroll. It emerged independently of Peter Hart's analysis. Two motifs are present in this case study what is termed proof by constant reassertion and generalizing from exceptions. It illustrates the use and abuse of fragmentary, 
partially reported and non-existent evidence to sustain overarching conclusions. It also displays what happens when such research is left to its own devices, largely untouched by outside scrutiny. It shows that despite advertisements to the contrary, critical self-reflection is not a characteristic of the revisionist approach. I consider historians' treatment of an aspect of the War of Independence conflict in Monaghan in 1921. Cavan, Donegal and Monaghan were three Ulster counties retained in the Southern Irish Free State. During the 1912-14 Home Rule Crisis, Ulster Unionist leader Edward Carson commended armed Monaghan loyalists occupying what he termed the outposts of Ulster. However, in the 1918 Westminster general election, Sinn Féin candidates, one of whom was Protestant, won both Monaghan seats. Protestant Unionist dominance in Northern Ireland would have been destabilised by adding Monaghan's 75% Roman Catholic majority. For this reason, the Ulster Unionist Council abandoned their Donegal Monaghan and Cavan Brethren. But before and after what the Monaghan's Unionist Northern Standard newspaper called this deliberate betrayal, Monaghan loyalists fought the IRA and persecuted local Roman Catholics. Revisionist historians instead portrayed a sectarian IRA that victimised Protestants. I look in particular at their analysis of the April 1921 death of Kate Carroll. A coherent narrative of the past is, or should be, sustained at each point by reference to evidence. Without relevant, adequately interpreted and publicly available source material, purported history tends toward fiction. Explanations of Kate Carroll's fate in research by Marie Coleman, Anne Dolan, Terence Dooley, Dermot Ferreter, Brian Hanley, Fergal McGarry, Unano Halpin and Tim Wilson, published between 1986 and 2018, will be considered in that context. I will also briefly survey contrasting treatments of anti-Catholic pogroms in Belfast in 1920-22. to let us look first at analysis by Professor Terence Dooley of Maynooth University, who specialised later in his career as a historian of the Irish Big House. In his 1986 MA thesis on Monaghan Loyalists, Dooley accused the IRA of being involved in callous sectarian crimes. He wrote that in April 1921, the IRA rank and file, obsessed with ancient grievances, murdered a middle-aged female Protestant spinster named Kate Carroll. She had, he observed, been suspected of giving information to the Royal Irish Constabulary, the RIC. Dooley repeated himself in 1988. In a 1990 chapter in an edited collection and in a further 2000 study of Monaghan Protestants. After Dooley made the ancient grievances point, all four works asserted. As Kate Carroll was a Protestant who was murdered against directions of a general IRA headquarters order, specifying that female spies be warned, not killed, this would suggest that local IRA units did more or less what they liked, and that in a county such as Monaghan, where Protestants had traditionally held the upper hand, IRA policy was dictated to a certain extent not by a national cause, but by a desire to exact revenge at a local level. Dooley wrote, without evidence, that Carroll's execution was carried out in defiance of Monaghan's IRA leadership. More generally, Dooley viewed loyalists the IRA targeted as sectarian victims. Dooley was the first researcher to make use of 1960s testimonies on the conflict in Monaghan. IRA veterans had been interviewed for what became known as the Marin Collection. Surprisingly, although some veterans spoke about Kate Carroll's death, Dooley's four publications did not cite or even mention them. Instead, he relied on the Northern Standard account, which reproduced publicity from Dublin Castle, the seat of British administration, and on his own speculations. Attention is apparent in Dooley's claim that Carroll's execution was sectarian, despite also stating that the IRA suspected her of informing. The tension can disappear if historians demonstrate that Carroll's religion fueled or overdetermined IRA suspicion. Subsequent studies reinforced that view. They introduced also additional non-political reasons for the IRA's apparent vendetta against Kate Carroll. Carroll's fate attracted more attention in 2005. In Fergal McGarry's well-received biography of Monaghan IRA leader Owen O'Duffy, McGarry promoted a new narrative combining sectarianism 
and illegally distilled whiskey, or putchin, as it is more commonly known. McGarry cited Dublin Castle's news releases in the Dundalk Democrat newspaper and a later report of proceedings of a British military court of inquiry. At the court, Kate Carroll's invalid brother, Patrick, reportedly stated that her IRA abductor asked Kate, are you making any drink now? Kate Carroll allegedly responded that she was not and that she would not pay any more fines. Her brother also reported that his sister had been raided many times by the IRA for making whiskey and that she had also been fined by the government for making illicit whiskey. From this, McGarry deduced that Carroll distilled putchin illegally, of course. McGarry also cited part of the RIC County Inspector's report on Kate Carroll for April 1920. The inspector reproduced Dublin Castle's narrative and said of Carroll, seeing others making putchin, Carroll sent out a letter to the police telling about them. This letter was captured on the raid on the mails and Kitty was taken out of her house over 16, 17 April, marched a mile away and shot dead. The usual IRA notice was forthcoming, but this also is believed to be a case of sheltering behind their terrorism. According to McGarry's interpretation of this report, Carol had informed on her competition. But since the IRA had allegedly intercepted Carol's fateful letter, how would the RIC inspector know its contents? Furthermore, how could McGarry know that Carol was informing on rival putchin makers, not on IRA members or operations? Finally, why would Carol assume that the RIC would be interested in her putchin making competitors to the extent of ignoring her own illegal enterprise? These elementary questions were not posed. Equally puzzlingly, McGarry also observed that, unlike other executions, in this case, the RIC inspector confirmed what McGarry termed the IRA's account. The reported question from her abductor to Kate Carroll, are you making any drink now, became in McGarry's mind the IRA's account of her death. That is a remarkably thin thread for McGarry's conclusion that Kate Carroll was killed merely over Putchin. The inspector implied, including in an unsighted passage, that as Carol was paying off a fine imposed some years previously, she was not currently distilling. IRA testimony on Carol's death also existed, but as we shall see, it was sidelined. For McGarry, Kitty Carroll was a person of no social consequence, a middle-aged Protestant spinster. He surmised, the charge of spying appears to have been a convenient rationale for the execution of an obvious and anti-social security risk. In other words, Carol's illegal distilling, her religion and unmarried status were the sole factors in her death. Rooted as he was in the vein of research established by Peter Hart, McGarry did not countenance even the remote possibility that Carol might have assisted Crown forces against the IRA. McGarry agreed with Terence Dooley that Carroll's execution was based on a desire to extract sectarian revenge. Unlike Dooley, he thought Brigade Commander Owen O'Duffy was implicated. Again, following Dooley, McGarry characterised as inevitably sectarian the IRA's clashes with Monaghan's loyalist forces. They were described by Tim Wilson, another historian, as pro-state militias, a fifth column, in which the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, and the new Ulster Special Constabulary, recruited from the UVF, were augmented by self-constituted town guards. In McGarry's circular logic, any IRA opposition to such avowedly quasi or paramilitary forces, Protestants with guns as Wilson described them, was sectarian. That was because IRA members were primarily Roman Catholic, implied McGarry. He agreed with Peter Hart's observation that, Capital punishment was far more likely to be meted out to Protestants who provoked hostility or suspicious suspicion than to Catholic transgressors. The theory does not hold in Monaghan, where the IRA executed eight people as spies, of whom one was Protestant, in a county where 25% of the population were Protestant. It is time now to move to a third representation, from TCD historian Anne Dolan that quite spectacularly refashioned Carroll's status as a marginalised sectarian victim. Dolan's 2011 essay, Ending War in a Sportsmanlike Manner, The Milestone of Revolution, 1919 to 23, opened with, There were five bullets in Kitty Carroll's body when it was found in April 1921. 
Dolan followed McGarry in suggesting that Carroll may have informed on those IRA men who seemed intent on hounding her out of her putching business. Equally without evidence, she referred to Carroll being fined by a Republican court. Dolan reported, the British Military Court of Inquiry investigating her death declared that Carroll was probably suspected of disclosing information to the police with regard to local Sinn Féin activities. As the court politely put it, Carroll was a woman of feeble intellect. The allegedly feeble-minded Carroll was now literally an unwitting victim. The problem is the court did not find any of the things Dolan asserted. Court findings ventured no motive for Carroll's execution and they expressed no view on her intellect. It appears that Dolan misread the notes of a British official called Francis Hemming. He compiled information on IRA activity, possibly for his superior, Hamar Greenwood, the last British Chief Secretary for Ireland. Hemming's commentary appeared to rehash Dublin Castle reports that appeared in the 23 April Dundalk Democrat and other newspapers. Nothing to do with the Military Court of Inquiry. One report stated that the IRA had captured anonymous letters from Carroll to the RIC about illicit drink traffic. Kate Carroll's 80-year-old mother, Susan, not her daughter, was reported as the possessor of a feeble mind. Had she read the report, Dolan might have spotted the similarities and the anomaly. Instead, Dolan cited an 86-word summary in a not verbatim Marin Collection extract. It concluded, note, many details missing, indeed. Having misread her source, who appears to have misread the Castle report, Dolan took the story in a startling new direction. She reported, the Court of Inquiry never found out that Kitty Carroll had been pestering one of the local IRA volunteers, that she had some notion that one of them might marry her. Dolan mused, perhaps some fumbled promise on a dark evening had not been kept in the cold light of day when the once amorous volunteer no longer liked what he saw. Are we to assume that a nameless cad played a part in shooting Kate Carroll for male chauvinist and intensely personal reasons, burying the personal in the political until Dr. Dolan arrived to unearth the truth? The source for this remarkable twist was Curator at Monaghan County Museum. Unfortunately, the person who occupied and occupies that position has no view on the subject and cannot remember ever speaking on it to Dr. Dolan. Even had he, the curator was not alive in 1921. Dolan's discipline is, we should remind ourselves, history and not romantic fiction. Dolan concluded that, in Kitty Carroll's case, you could argue that she was killed because she was a Protestant. You can argue that she was killed because she was a nuisance to a man. Well, you can argue whatever you like. Evidence usually helps. In this sinister space, it is all ifs, buts and maybes, but tied to an overarching sectarian certainty. As Dolan put it, Carol might be a spy, she might not. There might be some personal grievance, there might not. And then, of course, she is a Protestant as well. Dolan wrote that, festering under the quite sanitised surface of Irish nationalism where what may have been little more than a sequence of dirty deeds. Dolan's article title and content were inspired by a British propaganda leaflet, stating that the IRA failed to adhere to the laws and customs of war. These were drawn up, it said, in order that war between white men should be carried out in a sportsmanlike manner and not like fights between savage tribes. Dolan conceded that this phraseology might seem terribly inappropriate, but concluded the Irish had offended against British forces' etiquette of war. The leaflet author, Brigadier General Charles Fuchs, was director of Irish propaganda and had an interesting pedigree. He was director of gas services during World War I and afterwards wanted poison gas to be openly accepted as a fair weapon. Before arriving in Ireland, Fuchs was in India. There, alongside Winston Churchill, he vainly urged the use of gas against Afghan rebels. They were, he said, vermin only fit for extermination. The troops regard them as bloodthirsty, treacherous savages. Dolan's views of ethical conduct during wartime relied on a poison gas enthusiast with racist, imperialist and genocidal views. 
The first two of these prejudices were reflected in Fuchs's message to the IRA. Doolan did not consider Crown Force dirty deeds, some of which I discuss in my accompanying essay. She misattributed responsibility solely to Irish Republicans, particularly in a final unsourced paragraph. She wrote, Tom Barry referred to it as going down into the mire to find your freedom. It was no longer, as Fuchs said, war in a sportsmanlike manner. West Cork IRA commander Barry in fact asserted something quite different. He wrote in Guerrilla Days in Ireland in 1949, the British were met with their own weapons. They had gone down in the mire to destroy us and our nation and down after them we had to go to stop them. Barry continued, the step was not an easy one for one's mind was darkened and one's outlook made bleak by the decisions which had to be taken. In essence, Dolan bookended her analysis of Kate Carroll's death between misread British and Irish sources. Dolan's Kate Carroll as romantically spurned Protestant was reproduced in 2015 in Dermot Ferreter's A Nation and Not a Rabble. Ferreter reproduced 62 words from what he termed Dolan's arresting opening, describing five bullets in Kitty Carroll's body. He cited her misreading of Tom Barry as though it were accurate and observed also that Carroll may have had amorous intent towards an IRA man. Ferreter asked rhetorically, was this really about spying? To find out, we need to look at largely ignored IRA sources of information, which might throw light on the nature of Carroll's correspondence with the RIC. Two Bureau of Military History IRA witness statements, available after 2003, and therefore to McGarry and Dolan, presented an alternative scenario. So too did Marin Collection testimonies, available also to Terence Dooley. IRA volunteer John McConnell observed that, as a result of information got in raids on mails, there was no doubt as to Carroll's guilt. Subsequent Garda Superintendent James McKenna stated, the proof was very strong. He continued, as opposed to another spy who was intelligent and shrewd and much more difficult to detect, Carroll was scarcely normal and was not sufficiently intelligent to cloak her activities. What of the Marin Collection? It included four Scotstown IRA battalion members referring to Carol matter-of-factly as one of two local spies who were shot. Others remarked that spies undermined IRA capacity to engage the enemy. They had caused volunteers to be arrested and badly assaulted. IRA intelligence operative Joe Shevlin worked in Monaghan's post office, where he decoded coded messages between police and military. He named Carol as suspected of sending correspondence to the police at Monaghan and observed that Carroll was confronted with one of those postal communications. McGarry cited Shevlin on the unremarkable fact that the IRA labelled Carroll a spy. His post office position and other testimony was ignored. Likewise, McGarry cited James McKenna's remark that Carroll was scarcely normal, but not on what McKenna termed very strong evidence against her. Anne Dolan cited an IRA veteran's Marin collection statement that Carroll was, by any standards, a half-wit, but omitted his expression of regret, even if she was guilty of what she was accused of. Dooley, McGarry and Dolan did not cite available IRA testimony to the effect that Kate Carroll had informed. Also, no IRA account mentioned Putchin. The reason why the RIC county inspector and, following him, McGarry, said Carroll was shot. Still, no pun intended, arguably IRA accounts, while attributing guilt, did not detail precisely what Carroll had done to merit execution. Did any historian possess such evidence? One did and discussed it in 2006. But in such circumstances that other Irish historians had no idea what he said. He mentioned it again seven years later, but so obscurely that it had the same non-effect. Before detailing that, we must clarify one very important matter. Besides no interest in Putchin, no IRA account discussed Carroll's religion. Equally striking, no reference appeared in British or media accounts. Dooley, McGarry and Dolan appeared oblivious to an absence of what would have been a British propaganda godsend. There was good reason for official reticence on the point. Kate Carroll was not Protestant. No referenced or available source, local or national, identified Carroll as Protestant. 
It is not in newspaper accounts cited by Dooley and McGarry or in any source Dolan looked at. No alarm bells rang, it seems, at the lack of evidence to support historians' sectarianism interpretation. Take the 1911 census that reported the Carroll family as Roman Catholic. That census went online in 2009, the census schedules having been available since 1961. There is no apparent source-related basis for Dooley's initial or McGarry's subsequent assertion that Carroll was Protestant. Nevertheless, sharing the same basic assumptions, Dolan Ferreter and also Timothy Wilson continued to publish the mistaken claim. Instead of the discovery that Carroll was Catholic stimulating a critical reappraisal, revisionist historians supplanted Protestantism with Putschine and Love Gone Sour as proximate causes of Carroll's execution. Before detailing that, we should first discuss another anomaly in the story of how Kate Carroll's story was told. Professor Eunan O'Halpin of TCD disclosed important privately held IRA testimony when he spoke in 2006 to the Australian Army's annual Chief of Army Military History Conference. Its proceedings that year, which were not publicly available, addressed the theory and conduct of small wars and insurgencies. Conference organizers identified the ways in which we must meet and defeat insurgents. Speakers, many with practical experience, considered conflict in various colonial hotspots, including lessons learned fighting liberation forces in white minority ruled Rhodesia and South Africa. O'Halpin presented anonymized testimony on Kate Carroll's death, to which, based on a family connection, only he had access. I looked at the material that became available recently in Monaghan County Museum. It is from Thomas Brennan, an IRA intelligence officer and second in command of the IRA's 5th Northern Division. Brennan's handwritten IRA notebook, composed in the 1930s, fleshed out previously cited IRA accounts of Kate Carroll's fate. Brennan reported some very startling stories in letters addressed to RIC military that the IRA intercepted in Monaghan Post Office. Brennan highlighted one case in particular that gave information about where the IRA had an arms dump and where the boys stopped at night. This person, Kate Carroll, sent letters again and again to RIC Scottstown wanting to know why these fellows were not arrested and their arms seized. Brennan reported this to Brigade OC Owen O'Duffy. In accordance with General Order 13 on women spies, O'Duffy sent two men to warn Carroll to stop this at once. She denied giving information. However, as Brennan pointed out, proof was forthcoming next day. Carroll wrote again to Scottstown RIC, describing said Brennan, the men who had given her the warning. IRA advice to cease informing did not anticipate a recipient treated leniently on grounds of gender informing on those with relatively good news. Carol's decision may exceptionally have sealed her fate and possibly also explained IRA descriptions of a scarcely normal half-wit. Surprisingly, after presenting Thomas Brennan's seemingly solid evidence to the Australian Army and its invited guests, O'Halpin persisted in describing Carroll as an alleged informer who had supposedly given information. Her unseen letters to the RIC were, said O'Halpin, demented rather than informative. Nevertheless, however much he disapproved of the outcome, O'Halpin revealed in 2006 the detailed charge against Kate Carroll. He had resolved the mystery of why she was shot. Unfortunately, because the Australian Army Conference proceedings were not public, other historians and interested members of the public remained unaware of the contents of Thomas Brennan's notebook until today. Seven years elapsed before O'Halpin reintroduced the still privately held evidence in a this time accessible essay. Brennan was not named in O'Halpin's main text, but was in end notes. In addition, Brennan's explanation for Carroll's execution was presented more obscurely than it had been in 2006. O'Halpin essentially regurgitated McGarry's putching based story, which IRA testimony undermined. He did so as follows. Carroll resented IRA interference in her distilling and wrote chaotic letters to the RIC in Scottstown, denouncing their inaction against the IRA and rival illicit distillers. O'Halpin continued, 
Some of these were intercepted by an IRA informant in Monaghan Post Office. She was warned off, but wrote another letter. Putchin distillation is given by O'Halpin as the basis of Carroll's informing and as the basis of her execution, but Brennan had not mentioned it. Carroll's letters to the RIC, previously described as demented by O'Halpin, were now somehow chaotic. In another source-free claim, the letters allegedly denounced rival illicit distillers. Inexplicably absent from this account is Brennan's assertion that Carroll informed on IRA volunteers who warned her to stop having previously pinpointed the location of IRA arms and personnel. In 2013, O'Halpin drew readers' attention instead to additional new information. While no IRA testimony discussed alcohol, it featured in 1960s handwritten observations by Nula O'Neill, daughter of a by then elderly IRA veteran. O'Halpin mistakenly presented Charlie O'Neill as the author of his daughter's commentary whose text referred to my father and daddy. She wrote, as she put it, on things that bothered her father, who was imprisoned when Carol was shot. As compared with the treatment of Brennan, O'Halpin reproduced O'Neill's text. She wrote that Carol was often seen around the barracks, selling putchine to soldiers and anyone who would buy it. O'Halpin interjected that Carol was considered harmless, whereas Nula O'Neill wrote that Carol was perceived as having talked a bit, and therefore the IRA began to suspect her of carrying tales. In a passage O'Halpin cited at length, ascribed to Charlie O'Neill and juxtaposed to the now obscured Brennan testimony, Nula O'Neill continued, It is now thought, in the 1960s, that one of the volunteers himself was an informer, but deliberately shifted the blame onto Kate Carroll. O'Neill did not discuss why or how or by whom this thought had occurred, nor did she address the identity, if known, of the supposed IRA informer. Of course, O'Neill may have been right, and it is important that O'Halpin presented and considered seriously her speculation, but it is not immediately apparent why O'Halpin wrapped in anonymity and comparative obscurity, alternative more explicit and arguably more authoritative testimony from Thomas Brennan. O'Halpin did acknowledge that one Monaghan veteran wrote the proof against Carroll was very strong, but he did not identify it, even in end notes, as previously discussed Bureau of Military History testimony from James McKenna. Astonishingly, O'Halpin then stated that the man who investigated Kate Carroll's letters to the RIC wrote an apologetic and incomplete account emphasising that the unwelcome execution order came from Brigade OC Owen O'Duffy, a man always happy to have others pull the trigger on supposed informers. This passage is either based on an unidentified source or it misinterprets Thomas Brennan's testimony. Since she did not mention them, Nula O'Neill, and also possibly her father, may not have been aware of Carol's letters to the RIC. Her opinions may have been residually influenced by Dublin Castle publicity. Another factor should be considered. The text and a separate, also handwritten summary of her father's recollections display an abiding animosity toward Owen O'Duffy. He was a controversial Free State Guard Commissioner from 1922 until February 1933, when a new anti-treaty Fianna Fáil government dismissed him. O'Duffy, who became Fine Gael's first leader, then led the proto-fascist Army Comrades Association, the Blue Shirts, which violently opposed both Fianna Fáil and the IRA. It is possible that later antipathy toward O'Duffy affected Newell O'Neill's commentary on the earlier period. Text in Charlie O'Neill's handwriting describing his experiences contains no hint of his daughter's opinions. Turning back though to Thomas Brennan, if his explanation of Kate Carroll's execution had been widely known in or after 2006, and or if it had been similarly detailed in 2013, historians might have written differently. Curiously, by not giving Carroll a false Protestant identity in 2006, perhaps O'Halpin was at least tacitly acknowledging uh, that Dooley and McGarry's views on that point were not tenable. If so, that insight, in addition to Brennan's testimony, 
might have been useful to Anne Dolan, a TCD colleague in 2011, and to UCD's Dermot Ferreter in 2015. In 2015 also, Marie Coleman of Queen's University Belfast publicly corrected the Protestant Kate Carroll mistake in a collection part edited by Dermot Ferreter. She had been alerted to the error by Dahi O'Coroin. He had worked with Unino Halpin on a soon-to-be-published database, The Dead of the Irish Revolution. The essay following Coleman's was by Anne Dolan, who again discussed Kate Carroll. This time, Carroll's illegal occupation, alleged romantic entanglements, and supposed religion, which had loomed large in Dolan's 2011 contribution, were ignored. Unaware of Thomas Brennan's testimony, Marie Coleman attempted briefly to rationalise the 29-year-old error concerning Kate Carroll. In Coleman's essay, historians Dooley and McGarry, but not for some reason Anne Dolan, were named in endnotes as having previously made the mistaken assumption that Carroll was Protestant. Coleman's main text excused the error. The IRA's exceptional execution of a woman had, she wrote, led historians to question if there was a sectarian motive to Carroll's killing. Let us leave aside the fact that Dooley and McGarry, plus Dolan, had not merely questioned but had promoted a sectarian motive for Carroll's execution. Coleman here seemed to suggest as valid a belief that Carroll's fate was more readily sealed if she were a Protestant rather than a Roman Catholic woman. Put another way, the historian's own pre-existing and arguably sectarian assumptions both encouraged and excused publication of historical fiction. One historian, Brian Hanley, reflected self-critically on his 2010 book, The IRA, A Documentary History, mislabeling Carroll as Protestant. He observed in 2016 that historians writing on the contentious subject of sectarianism must do so with care. Dermot Ferreter's A Nation and Not a Rabble had used Hanley's book and also Anne Dolan's 2011 essay in reference to Carroll. In accepting responsibility for misleading Ferreter, having himself been misled by Dooley and or McGarry, Hanley wrote, I had made the assumption that Carroll was Protestant. She was described as such in several accounts, without checking the relevant source material. Hanley did not mention Ferreter's more extensive reliance on Dolan's research. Despite Marie Coleman's correction in 2015, Protestant Kate Carroll made her final appearance in 2017. In Tim Wilson's contribution to a book of essays dedicated to Roy Foster. Citing Fergal McGarry, Tim Wilson's otherwise incisive dissection of The Strange Death of Loyalist Monaghan described Protestants as having a heterogeneous existence, ranging from landowners like the Rossmores and Leslies, both with the states above 13,000 acres, down to, he observed, Kitty Carroll, a putcheen maker living on a few acres of wretched mountain land. We now know that rather than an exceptionally poor Protestant, Kate Carroll was a typically impoverished papist, whose circumstances may have left her ripe for RIC exploitation. Dooley and McGarry reconnected with Carroll in 2017 and 2018. One of them admitted to their shared error. In his 2017 book on Monaghan from 1916 to 23, Terence Dooley, originator of the then 31-year-old Protestant Kate Carroll myth, reintroduced her as a Catholic spinster. He wrote, the contemporary newspaper stated that Carol was a Protestant, thereby suggesting a sectarian dimension to her murder. Dooley now endorsed McGarry's opinion that Carol was executed because she was an antisocial security risk who had come to the IRA's attention for illicit distilling. Otherwise, Dooley ignored his and McGarry's sectarianism error merely observing in an end note that, in earlier work, I mistakenly identified Carroll as a Protestant, as stated in newspaper reports of the time. Apart from observing that no such reports were cited by Dooley, that explanation does not appear to be factual. The Northern Standard Report, which Dooley habitually cited, said nothing about Carroll's religion. Neither did other newspapers.
In his notes, Dooley identified only one of his four earlier texts in which his mistake had appeared. That also was less than satisfactory. Dooley corrected one error, Carroll was Protestant, with yet another, Arrhenius press reports led me astray. The precise origin of Dooley's myth remains, in other words, a mystery. However, in 2017, Dooley silently revised his linked view that many IRA volunteers were involved in sectarian crimes. Instead, he now acknowledged that 1916 to 23 witnessed a low incidence of sectarian murders in Monaghan. Rather than credit Irish Republicans' commitment to non-sectarianism for this happy circumstance, Dooley speculated that it may have been largely due to the unionist community's ability to protect itself. In contrast to Eunan O'Halpin's view of Owen O'Duffy as trigger happy, Dooley expanded further without any visible evidence that, but for IRA leader Owen O'Duffy's restraining influence, the number of sectarian casualties would have been much higher. By extension, this suggests that the rank and file were intent on sectarian violence, motivated by revenge, possibly embedded in historical ancestral grievances or jealousies as much as contemporary events. Dooley's new evidence-free theory alleged that the IRA was still murderously sectarian, but a lot less successfully than he previously thought. Dooley thus preserved his original argument with a new but vacuous claim, despite having abandoned the previous alleged evidence that formerly had sustained it. Like McGarry, Dooley promoted a loose, broad and contradictory definition of sectarian violence. It included Republican attacks on members of the paramilitary Ulster Special Constabulary and on loyalists who had shot IRA volunteers. It seems clear from Tim Wilson's account that in 1919-21, Monaghan loyalists were well-armed and aggressive but that Irish Republican forces militarily defeated them. Put another way, they were unable to impose the kind of repressive control over nationalists that their Unionist peers successfully imposed in the six counties. However, in defeating Loyalist sectarianism in Monaghan, Irish Republicans did not reverse engineer it. Dooley ignored these distinctions. He construed as sectarian a 1920 Republican boycott of goods produced in Belfast, although it was in response, he wrote, to 11,000 Catholic nationalists expelled by Unionist mobs from their jobs in Belfast, accompanied by the killing of 455 people, 58% of them Roman Catholics, who comprised 24% of the city's overall population. The extent of the violence which also included expelling over 23,000 mainly Catholic people from their homes and the destruction of over 500 Catholic owned businesses was first documented in G.B. Kenna's Facts and Figures of the Belfast Pogrom in 1922, which is available online at academia.edu. Kenna was a pseudonym for Father John Hassan. He dedicated his book to Northern Protestants who opposed the violence perpetrated by reactionary unionists. He included within it eyewitness testimony of expelled Protestant trade unionist James Baird. McGarry's approach in his biography of O'Duffy was similar to Dooley's. The Belfast expulsions merely, he wrote, raised sectarian tensions. Does that imply that opposition to sectarianism was itself sectarian? While the Belfast boycott may be criticised as ineffective, it was motivated to restore to their jobs those thousands who included Protestant trade unionists expelled from their workplaces and to deter then rampant loyalist violence. Dooley and McGarry have in common that they overlooked or de-emphasized virulent loyalist sectarian actions but characterized and distorted republican responses as sectarian. Likewise, they failed to note that loyalist retaliation for Republican attacks tended to be indiscriminate collective punishment, aimed at the nearest available Roman Catholics. The IRA, on the other hand, usually turned its weapons on those identified as actual combatants. In 2018, in an essay in Volume 4 of the Cambridge History of Ireland, Fergal McGarry returned to Kate Carroll's fate, without indicating her religion. That was after making the point cited at the outset of this talk concerning revisionist accounts presenting a more complex picture of the revolution at its grassroots.
McGarry wrote on this occasion that in Monaghan, Republicans killed Kate Carroll because her involvement in putching making gave rise to concerns about spying, but her marginal status and more intimate factors may have contributed to her death. Unlike Dooley, but following Dolan, McGarry ignored earlier claims about Carroll's supposed Protestantism. He referenced, however, his 2005 O'Duffy biography and Ferreter's 2015 account, which featured Carroll as Protestant. His new assertion that more intimate factors may have contributed to Carroll's death relied on Ferreter's use of Anne Dolan's romantically rebuffed Protestant narrative. The problematic original source for Dolan's 2011 allegation, not repeated in her 2015 essay that mentioned Carroll, was thereby doubly, if not triply, obscured in McGarry's reiteration of Dolan's claim via Ferreter. If that fantastic story has a factual basis, it is not available to historians. To conclude, the evidence properly scrutinised shows that Carroll is no longer Protestant, feeble-minded, spurned by a volunteer who dishonoured her, or even a snit on her fellow moonshine makers. She was possibly out of her depth, became an informer, and ignored warnings to desist. That does not mean that she should have been executed, but it is a reason she was executed. Much of the evidence supporting this conclusion was available, yet ignored when Dooley, McGarry, Dolan and Ferreter were writing. The most significant IRA testimony from Thomas Brennan was known to Professor Yunan O'Halpin in 2006, but, for reasons outlined, appears to have remained unknown to others interested in the subject. Those who promoted the story of Kate Carroll, Protestant putching maker, preferred British to IRA accounts of Carroll's death. In depicting her as a Protestant whose death had a sectarian dimension, they went far beyond even the limits of contemporary British propaganda. Dismissing IRA testimony while endorsing tendentious British accounts indicates a collective condition of selection bias. But why does contemplation of the individual role and fate of Protestants occupy such space within revisionist historiography, as compared to that of thousands of Roman Catholics in Belfast, and of those socialists and trade unionists who suffered alongside them? If I could use a journalism analogy. During the 1970s guerrilla insurgency against minority white supremacy in Rhodesia, a two-part cartoon illustrated Western media reactions to news of two massacres. In part one, a newsroom is thrown into a dizzying deadline frenzy when its wire service spat out news of the death of white-skinned civilians. In part two, a journalist becomes re-energized at incoming news of black victims of white violence but unimpressed semi-comatose colleagues lazily deflate him with, to the effect of, so what, dog bites man. The cartoon expressed a truism, that dead white people had a higher news value by virtue of their skin complexion. For some Irish historians, so too do Irish Protestants. Real, or in this case, imagined. If the cartoon illustrates a type of racism, our story constitutes a species of sectarianism. Whereas the fate of an individual Roman Catholic is seldom dwelt upon as a sectarian victim, that of a Protestant is invariably. That might seem an odd observation, especially considering that the historians critiqued here are mainly from a cultural Roman Catholic background. Perhaps they are overcompensating in a profession which for many years endured intense official and media scrutiny of history relating to the Irish national or British imperialism question. As the late Professor Roland Fanning put it, throughout Northern Ireland's long war from 1968 to 1997, the British and Irish political establishments sought to control the presentation of the history of 1912 to 22 in order to buttress and legitimize their own authority, while at the same time denying legitimacy and authority to the provisional IRA and other paramilitary forces. Another way to put it is that Suspected loyalists make for first-class victims. Nationalists who are victims of Crown force violence or of violence in support of the Crown, including the thousands driven from their homes and livelihoods in Belfast and surrounding areas, tend to be footnotes to allegations of IRA sectarianism. 
Fergal McGarry was therefore mistaken in asserting that the end of the more recent troubles saw much heat dissipate from these Irish history disputes. In fact, the end is precisely when their contemporary aspect emerged, as controversial accounts of the 1919-21 to conflict in Cork and the Monaghan-based research discussed here fully demonstrate. Revisionist history needs to be read, but treated in the same manner as historians should treat their sources, that is, critically. Revisionist historians retaining a critical faculty need to break out of their self-reinforcing and self-referential cocoon. Otherwise, those seeking objective understanding must seek authoritative historical accounts elsewhere. That concludes my talk on this subject. If you are still interested, I suggest reading my accompanying essay, which is available on academia.edu. There you will also find facts and figures of the Belfast pogrom. It relates events that started 100 years ago in Belfast and spread to surrounding areas. I hope you find it of interest. Thank you very much.